Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan and today we're tackling ARDS, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Let's jump in with our practice question and get things started. So the nurse is caring for a client with ARDS and the physician has ordered non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. You're going to hear this abbreviated NIPV at N-I-P-P-V. So the nurse understands that therapeutic goal of NIPV is to what? We have A, providing supplemental oxygen to correct hypoxemia, B, reducing the work of breathing and improving ventilation, C, treating underlying pulmonary infections with that positive pressure, or D, preventing the development of a tension pneumothorax. So think through that here for a second, pause it if you need to, but hang on to what you think the answer is and we'll circle back at the end of the episode. First, we're going to break down ARDS, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. It is a life-threatening condition where the lungs essentially become too damaged and too inflamed to do their job. Oxygen cannot get in, carbon dioxide cannot get out, so gas exchange, no go. Now, picture the lungs like a sponge full of tiny little sacs. These air sacs are called alveoli. That's where the gas exchange happens. Oxygen crosses into the bloodstream so we can get it out to our tissues. And carbon dioxide exits to go into the lungs so we can exhale and get rid of that. But in ARDS, all these little sacs in the sponge, these alveoli, start filling up with fluid. It's a bunch of gunk that should never have been in there in the first place, but we get some sort of triggering event that causes it. Now, this trigger, it could be sepsis, trauma, burns, aspiration, an overdose, near drowning, you name it. But whatever it is, that trigger sets off a massive inflammatory response inside the lungs. It's like the immune system is like bringing in the cavalry, but in the process, it damages everything else. There is a ton of collateral damage. The capillary endothelium, the alveolar epithelium, all those cell linings, all the structural layers of the alveoli that are supposed to keep them dry and functioning, they get damaged. So once those tissues are damaged, they get leaky. That membrane, those walls, they just leak fluid out. Imagine like a water balloon slowly becoming porous. We're poking holes in there. So fluid seeps out of the blood vessels and gets into those alveoli. Once fluid is collecting in the air sacs, gas exchange can't happen. All right, we can't get oxygen in and we can't get carbon dioxide out. All right, so this leads to pulmonary edema, fluid in the lungs. All right, fluid leaking from those leaky capillary membranes. They're collecting in the alveoli stopping gas exchange. Now, this pulmonary edema specifically is non-cardiogenic. That's going to be a key phrase here. Basically, the fluid in the lungs, it's not due to a cardiac cause. So if you see the phrase non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, you should be thinking ARDS. Oh my gosh, the lungs are filling with fluid and it's not the heart's fault. It's because we've got this trigger, massive inflammation. It made the capillary membrane leaky and fluid filled up those alveoli so we can't do gas exchange. All right, if that was not bad enough, it does actually get worse. All of this inflammation damaging the alveolar epithelium and all that inflammatory debris leads to the formation of something called a hyaline membrane. All right, I don't really care if you remember that phrase, hyaline membrane. Basically, it is like a rubbery coating inside the alveoli that is making an additional barrier to gas exchange. So now we've got an alveoli, our little air sac here, that is flooded and has a physical wall between oxygen and the blood vessels. So the end result here, if you remember anything, if you tuned me out, tune back in. When we have ARDS, we can't have gas exchange. We cannot get oxygen into the blood. So the client gets really hypoxic. We also can't get carbon dioxide out of the blood, which means it builds up and causes respiratory acidosis. Remember, CO2 is an acid. If that acid builds up, 
and the blood gets more acidic. It throws everything off from enzyme function to cardiac rhythm. So we start to see signs of that respiratory acidosis like rapid shallow breathing, confusion, rising CO2 on our blood gases. That all tells us poor gas exchange. No oxygen in, our client's hypoxic. No CO2 out, respiratory acidosis. So the case I have to walk through with you guys today, I'm just going to give you a little trigger warning that this is a pediatric client that did not make it. This was a nine-month-old baby. I was working in the PICU at the time, and he came in. I was in the PICU, so he had presented to the emergency department, and they transferred him up in full-blown respiratory distress. You mean you just do your across-the-room look, and you know this baby is sick. He is pale, cool to the touch. He's dusky around the lips, mottled, so clearly not oxygenating. Poor perfusion. His little body is not getting the oxygen it needs. Now you look at his respiratory effort. He's breathing really quickly, but really shallow. So he's breathing like 80 times a minute, but just not getting anything in. And we hook him up on the monitor. Obviously, the ED had done some of this, but he is satting his SpO2 oxygen saturation in the 40s to 50s. So immediately, this is an emergency. He was not a candidate for like, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or CPAP or BiPAP, he was intubated. Very quickly, we have him up on 100% FiO2. Remember that ventilator delivers both pressure and oxygen. So we are giving him as much oxygen as possible, but we still can't get his saturations out of the 80s. We go from like the 40s to the 80s, so we're making progress once we have that airway and we're giving FiO2, but we needed to increase the pressure, how much pressure we were pushing into his lungs in order to really get those oxygen saturations up. Somebody grabs an ABG while we're doing the intubation and getting him oxygenated and his ABG is trash. It is so bad. Severe respiratory acidosis, his hypercarbia, that CO2 is one of the highest I've ever seen it. It was in the upper 90s, okay? That is not normal. What's the normal for CO2, if you remember? 35 to 45, right? It is like double, excess of double what it should be. We know he's really, really hypoxic. We see he's not saturating. So low oxygen, high CO2, gas exchange is not happening. We know lungs are failing. So now actually assessing him as this is going on, Listen to his chest, and it is just crackle, crackle, rail, rail. There is clearly fluid in his chest. I would describe it as like a washer board, everything just rattling around in there. Pretty quickly after assessing, stabilizing, you know, getting on a ventilator, chest x-ray is ordered, and there were diffuse bilateral infiltrates. That is another kind of key buzzword for ARDS that I want you to remember diffuse bilateral infiltrates. So on both sides, spread around, it's sometimes described as a whiteout. On this particular x-ray, there was not any area of that lung that looked normal, all right? He was not oxygenating because those alveoli were filled with fluid, okay? At that point, we know it's ARDS. We see that he is hypoxic, hypercarbic. He has these diffuse bilateral infiltrates. The alveoli are full of fluid. What, what do we do? What is our job? In the PICU, we are supporting oxygenation. We want to do the job of the lungs while they heal if they can. So like I said, we were on 100% FiO2 and only getting his SATs into the 80s. This meant we had to turn up the PEEP. That stands for a positive and expiratory pressure. How much pressure are we pushing into those alveoli? Because they are filled with fluid and we've got that rubbery halane membrane blocking gas exchange, we're going to have to use a lot of pressure to keep those alveoli open and try to push oxygen into the bloodstream. We are trying to force gas exchange to happen. That high pressure, that peep, we've got to do it, but it does come with risk. Barotrauma, tension pneumo, Worsening lung injury, those are things you got to keep a really close eye on. Frequent ABGs, at first, as we're stabilizing, they're like every 30 minutes. We get them down to like every two hours, but 
each of those numbers tells us if we're making progress, if we need to turn up that peep, if we can start weaning down on the ventilator. That's our ultimate goal is that we're going to do the job of his lungs. We're going to let them heal and then we can wean down on that ventilator. Nothing that we're doing or that we've talked about yet, though, is addressing the root cause. What was the stimulus that caused this massive amount of inflammation leading to the ARDS? We have to roll up our sleeves, become detectives, and start figuring that out so we can treat it, right? If he's septic, he needs antibiotics. If it was an overdose, we need to treat for that substance. If it was a near drowning, right, whatever that inflammatory cause was, we need to treat that so it doesn't further injure the lungs. So kind of two different things going on. We're supporting the lungs, trying to do their job so they can heal, and then figuring out what the heck happened in the first place so we can treat that. One of the other things worth mentioning that we've got to do in the meantime, we've got to meet his nutritional needs. He is intubated and sedated. He's not eating orally. So we have to use TPN, that total parental nutrition, as we keep searching for that underlying cause. Now, after a couple of days, absolutely no improvement, the parents did come to us and say, hey, I don't know if this is, you know, worth telling you. They were clearly very upset about it, but they said a couple of days before his breathing got bad, they had found him. He had gotten into some baby oil and somehow he had aspirated on that. He had really severe aspiration pneumonia and the damage from that oil in his lungs had triggered a full-blown inflammatory response. It just shut down his alveoli. They started empiric antibiotics right away, but the damage was super extensive at that point and his lungs were not recovering. We actually eventually placed him on ECMO to try and bypass the lungs altogether and keep his blood oxygenated. But even with every intervention, his lungs were simply too damaged. And this case has really stayed with me, not just because of the outcome, but really it illustrates every single step of the ARDS pathway and why finding that underlying cause is so important. ARDS is not just, you know, oh, my my lungs need a little bit of help. It is about ventilation. We have got to support those lungs with positive pressure to reduce the work of breathing, and it buys us time while we find and treat the underlying cause, infection, aspiration, trauma, whatever it is. If you don't treat that trigger, the lungs won't heal. So key takeaway, in ARDS, those alveoli are full of fluid, and we don't have gas exchange. We can't get oxygen into our blood. We can't get carbon dioxide out. Our job is to help with that gas exchange use that positive pressure to reduce the work of breathing and improve ventilation and aggressively treat whatever caused this cascade in the first place. Okay, so with all that being said, let's circle it on back to our practice question and see if you now know the right answer and why. You're caring for a client in ARDS and the physician ordered NIPV, that non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. What is the therapeutic goal of that NIPV? Is it A, providing supplemental oxygen to correct the hypoxia? B, reducing the work of breathing, improving ventilation? C, treating the underlying pulmonary infection with positive pressure? Or D, preventing the development of a tension pneumo? So think about it. In our case, we were way past NIPV. We weren't non-invasive. We were invasively ventilated. And we were using PEEP to provide that positive pressure. In this case, less of an emergency, we're using NIPV, we're providing positive pressure. What does that positive pressure do? So A was providing supplemental oxygen. And yeah, NIPV does provide some degree of supplemental oxygen, but its goal is not providing the oxygen. We can do that with a nasal cannula. We don't have to have pressure to provide oxygen. What NIPV does is B. It reduces the work of breathing and improves ventilation. We are pushing pressure, positive pressure into those lungs to help with gas exchange. We are keeping those alveoli open to support ventilation, decrease respiratory muscle fatigue, and improve the overall respiratory function. 
It does not treat the underlying cause, the infection, choice C, and it doesn't prevent attention pneumothorax. In fact, that's one of the complications that can happen with positive pressure. We are always watching for barotrauma, and if we developed attention pneumo, we would need to stop that positive pressure, okay? So that's really your key takeaway. With ARDS, we need pressure. We are trying to force gas exchange. So positive pressure reduces your work of breathing and improves that ventilation. All right, future nurses, that is a wrap. If you found this pod helpful, I'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school, the NCLEX, continuing ed, and beyond. Archer Nursing has you covered with on-demand video lectures, high-yield question banks, live case study reviews, and so, so much more. We want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun. So join us over at archerreview.com. Follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time.